Well, we are picking up in where we left off in Exodus chapter 20 on our journey through the Ten Commandments, <clears throat> or what I've called First Things. We're now on Commandments 6 and 7 today, and honestly, I think I bit off more than I can chew. Um, and also, it's a very somber choice. In other words, today we are going to be dealing with the topic of murder <clears throat> and of adultery. So, if you were looking for a happy, clappy sermon, oh, today isn't one of those days. <laughs> but there is joy and there is grace. And I'm so thankful for Karen and the team and the way they led us this morning. For indeed, we need grace. Well, I was thinking about as we embark on Commandments 6 and 7, <clears throat> and it's no surprise that Satan, our enemy, would choose strategic ways to attack God's creation. So it's absolutely logical and strategic that his attack is pointed at the child-parent relationship. We talked about that last week in the fifth commandment. And on life itself, the sixth commandment. And then on marriage, the foundation for towns, societies, cultures, civilization. It's a very pointed and purposeful attack. So it makes sense why God, through his servant Moses, gave the Israelites the Ten Commandments to help them avoid these very pointed attacks against God's work and his creation. <clears throat> I'm reminded of how Satan works in 1 Peter 5.8. This will be a familiar passage for many of us. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. And we're going to uncover that today. For often sin is like a prowling lion. He's not roaring on the front end, not until he's got you in his teeth, but he's prowling, he's looking, he's poking for weaknesses. <clears throat> it starts small, and it ends so horribly wrong. <clears throat> well, let us together stand. Open up your Bibles to Exodus chapter 20. This is page 42 in your pew Bible. Exodus chapter 20. <clears throat> We're going to read verses 13 and verses 14 together out loud. Again, Exodus chapter 20, verses 13 and 14. Read these commandments with me out loud, would you? You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. Let's read those again. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. Let's pray. Father, I know <clears throat> how heavy my heart has been wrestling through these commandments. And I know that there are dear people in this room who have been devastated by murder and its various ways that we do murder and by adultery and the way that it destroys the covenant of marriage. So I, I ask you for your grace. I ask you that I would be a vessel to communicate your word this morning. Whatever I say that is not true or helpful may it blow away like chaff in the wind. And I pray you would give us today ears to hear and eyes to see and a heart that is soft and that can receive your grace. I pray all these things in the matchless name of our Savior Jesus, our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> the title for my sermon today <clears throat> is The Positive Side of the Commandments, if you will, Honor Life and Honor Marriage. Honor Life and Honor Marriage. And I'm going to do my best to teach this in a concise manner. I could stop on a lot of rabbit trails and we could dig really deep if we had an hour and a half for just the sermon. We could really go deep today. But I don't think we're going to be able to do that. And I don't want to subjugate you to that long of a sermon. So forgive me if I skip on some, some, some side tributaries that you've been wondering about. I'd love to talk to you about them. Um, but we won't have time for all of that today. So first Commandment number six, you shall not murder. Or the positive side of that, honor life. If we did a quick survey right now, 
I have no doubt that if I asked you the following question, you would say yes. And that question is, is it wrong to murder? And you would say, well, yes. If you went to your various places of employment and you asked your coworkers, is it wrong to murder? Oh, yeah, for sure, right? And you might ask, well, what reasons would you give? And they might talk about, well, how murder kind of tears at the fabric of society or murder hurts those that have to live with the knowledge of their friend or family member being murdered, etc. There are lots of good kind of logical or other ethical reasons for it, but first and foremost, as Christians, <clears throat> God forbids murder because it is the destruction of his image. We, in Genesis chapter 1, and we can turn there if you will, Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 27, we are made in God's image, the Latin imago Dei. And chapter t- uh, 1, verses 26 through 27 read, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish in the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So we, you, your children, are created in the image of God. We are a reflection of God. He is our creator and we are his creation. And he's not careless. He's very careful. So murder, at the very least and at its fundamental level, is forbidden because it is the destruction of of what God has created, and he created it good. And in the creation account, if we were to spend more time, we'd realize that creation of man and woman is the pinnacle of creation. It's the highest point, the climax. You, friend, are the climax of what God intended when he created. But what is murder, Pastor? What is murder? It's a question every little kid wonders about. And so here's the following five points I'm going to try to address today, the five questions. Why is murder wrong? What is murder? What does the sixth commandment forbid? How does the sixth commandment speak to us today? And how does Jesus take us deeper? So again, why is murder wrong? What is murder? What does the sixth commandment itself forbid? How does the sixth commandment speak to us today? And how does Jesus take us deeper? So if murder is the destruction of God's image bearers, this is what murder is not. Murder is not self-defense. In other words, self-defense is allowed according to the scriptures. Exodus 22, verses 2 through 3. If you're a note taker, write that down. We won't go there right now. But murder is not self-defense. Murder is also not capital punishment. In other words, the Old Testament and New Testament allows for capital punishment. We see that in Genesis chapter 9, verse 6, and Paul defends that in Romans chapter 13 when he's talking to the people in Rome and talking about the government and their right to wield the sword. So, capital punishment is not murder, and nor is just war. Now, we could spend a whole sermon series on what is just war and what wars are just or not. That's a a side issue Don't be tempted to go there just now. We don't have the time. But clearly, in the Old Testament, there is justifiable warfare. So therefore, our men and women serving in our armed forces are not murdering if they follow the just war and the ethics of it. So murder is not self-defense. Murder is not capital punishment. Murder is not just war either. So what is murder? In its purest form, murder is the premeditated or intentional taking of an innocent life. So if you're a note taker, it is the premeditated, intentional taking of an innocent life. And we first see this in the terrible account in Genesis chapter 4. Let's pull up Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 16. 
Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. And again, she bore his brother Abel. Now Abel was a keeper of the sheep and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of the flock and of their fat portions. So one's a gardener, one is a shepherd. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering he had no regard. So Cain was very angry, and his face fell. We're going to come back to anger here later. The Lord, in verse 6, said to Cain, Why are you angry, and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. There's that prowling lion. Its desire is for you, but you must rule over it. Verse 8, Cain spoke to Abel his brother, and when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel your brother? He answered, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. Oops, looks like that second slide didn't come there. So, we have the first instance of murder in the Old Testament. As if it wasn't bad enough that Adam and Eve had been removed from the garden, tainted with sin, covered with shame, and removed from the promise of eternal life, which was a mercy, but now they have to suffer the death of their son. Murder is the taking by premeditative desire of an innocent life. Murder in the Old Testament and in our laws here can also be intentional but unpremeditated taking of life. We call this voluntary manslaughter. Today's equivalence would be driving while impaired, whether it's through alcohol or drug abuse where you have an accident and somebody is killed. One of my father's uh, high school friends was a very famous Olympic diver. In fact, he was the last man to beat Greg Louganis. Uh, He was from the Rochester area in Minnesota. He himself was the victim of a drunk driver, and it broke most of the bones in his face. Um, His name is Bruce. I can't recall his last name off the top of my head. He later, some years later, while living in Florida, I believe, um, was drunk himself and ran into a block party of kids, and not all lived. And so he went to serve his prison time for that offense, for that voluntary manslaughter. He later published as part of his um, kind of repentance and his desire to, to heal the wrongs he had done, a driver's ed video that, unbeknownst to me, I watched in my high school class when I was taking driver's ed. So here was a guy, I remember hearing the story from my dad when I was littler, and now I'm watching him from the prison talk about the error of his judgment that day and the cost of it and how it will live with him forever. So, murder is most obviously the taking of an innocent life by a premeditated nature. It can also be intentional but unpremeditated, voluntary manslaughter. And it does point out how greatly God cares about our intention. Deuteronomy 19, 4 through 7 speaks of this. When God provides a a, a city of refuge, verse 4, this is the provision for the manslayer who by fleeing there may save his life. If anyone kills his neighbor unintentionally without having hated him in the past, When someone goes into the forest with his neighbor to cut wood and his hand swings the axe to cut down a tree and the head slips from the handle and strikes his neighbor so that he dies, he may flee to one of these cities and live, lest the avenger of blood in hot anger pursue the manslayer and overtake him because the way is long and strike him fatally, though the man did not deserve to die since he had not hated his neighbor in the past. Therefore, I command you, you shall set apart three cities. And so <clears throat> Moses, of course, God first, but they realize that there could be an instance of unintentional manslaughter. It was an accident. The ax slipped. So he provides a safe place for those so they can get a just trial. <clears throat> so we have several t- 
types of murder. But notice again, the intention is very key according to our Lord. The final implication, at least immediately in the Old Testament law, of manslaughter or of breaking the sixth commandment is negligent homicide. So in Deuteronomy 22.8, this is where Moses speaks and warns of building your house improperly and not putting a parapet on your roof. For he warns, if you do not put the parapet on your roof and your neighbor should die by falling off your roof because of your negligence, you are culpable. Um, Other instances of this is the goring ox example in Exodus 21. The farmer knows that his ox has a habit of goring, you know, him or his son, and he doesn't put the ox down or he doesn't put it away, but rather he lets his neighbor use it, and sure enough, it gores and kills his neighbor. This is negligent homicide. Modern-day examples that came to my mind immediately is in the city of Chicago, porch parties are really popular in the city. So you get on the back porch and people have a party. If they're not properly built, every summer, several of those porches collapse and people are crushed and killed. And that owner is held accountable. Or the uh, more global, if you will, instance of, of negligence on the industrial level is Chernobyl. And right now, what is a very popular series, I believe, on HBO, that nuclear meltdown and the negligence that caused it. So God cares about the loss of innocent life greatly. How does this then speak to us today? And this is where our topics get tough. We're going to talk about abortion, suicide, and euthanasia, and only very briefly. This could be a, a sermon series, each one. Abortion. I didn't even bother looking up the statistics on it because, frankly, it's so depressing. It is so depressing how many Innocent children are killed before they ever get a chance to breathe their first breath. And I realize this is a hard topic. I have a good friend back at our old church who was coerced into aborting her unexpected pregnancy and has lived with that from from that day forward. Thankfully, she's doing good ministry in helping teen mothers avoid that same mistake. So I recognize there are probably some of us in here who have experienced abortion. So I want to quickly remind you there is grace and there is forgiveness at the cross, both for the mother and for the father. For let us not forget it takes two. Psalm 139 and Psalm 102 both talk of abortion and or at least give us an insight into God's uh, God's insight into how he has made us and formed us and is a way for us to avoid the, the argument that it is just a surgical procedure and there's not a life there. I think we're having some difficulties in the back so I'll just read it here from my own version <clears throat> in the Bible, Psalm 139. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's room. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. Psalm 139. 13 through 18. Here we see God is the one who knits us in our mother's wombs. We were known to him before our eyes could see. Life begins at conception, my friends. That is not only a biblical truth, but it is a scientific truth. Anything that stops the life from continuing is therefore murder. This is extremely unpopular. I was just sucked into a Facebook uh, debate on this issue uh, and wasted probably too much time on that. We could say more here, but I will quote Psalm 102 for one of my heroes of the faith, Rosaria Butterfield, found this to be very compelling when she herself, being a former very progressive-minded woman, 
she found 102, Psalm 102, verse 18, to be incredibly convicting. And it changed her position from being, quote, pro-choice to pro-life. It reads this, Let this be recorded for a generation to come, so that a people yet to be created may praise the Lord. I'll read that again. Let this be recorded for a generation to come, so that a people yet to be created may praise the Lord. And what hit Rosaria was that abortion prevents those yet to be created to praise the Lord. Abortion stops future worshipers from having the chance to honor and glory God. And that stuck with me. I heard her talk about that in an interview. So abortion in our day and age is not a new way to murder, but it is certainly a prevalent way. Two, suicide. Now many of you know my first week here at the church, my father committed suicide. Uh, He was living in Red Wing at the time. So I understand, at least uh, to some degree, the pain of suicide. And I know there are others here who have experienced it as well. So please know that these words come with a heart that loves you and that wants to see God's grace working in your life. But friends, in an age where suicide is increasing rapidly, the scriptures do not talk of suicide positively. There are five descriptive instances of suicide in our scriptures, and none of them are put in a positive light. There are cultures that value suicide, honor suicide, very popular, especially in Japanese culture many years ago and even still today in some level. But our scriptures, friends, do not put suicide in a positive light. And I do not mean to heap more hurt on those who have suffered at the hands or at the, at the, at the, you know, the, the suicide that a friend or a family member has taken. But it is not viewed favorably. Suicide is sin. And it is horrible. And those people who commit suicide are in a horrible place. And we must have a heart of compassion. We must have a heart of compassion. But friends, if nothing else, please know that the scriptures would warn you, don't do it. It is murdering yourself. And if that keeps you from that final blow, then that's a good thing. Finally, euthanasia. That is the taking of life prematurely. It is growing in popularity here. Um, The first country to legalize, uh, to give legal status to physicians to assist with suicide was quite ironically the Netherlands. The Netherlands were known during Nazi occupation, the doctors were known, I should say, in the Netherlands for resisting the Nazi directives to euthanize the elderly and the disabled and those that were uh, seriously or critically ill. They would resist and disobey their Nazi superiors. And one generation later, they became the first country to legalize euthanasia in 2001. As Malcolm Muggeridge pointed out, and as Kevin DeYoung in his good book, The Ten Commandments, reminded us, it took but just one generation for Satan and the hardening of hearts to reverse in that great country. Euthanasia, my friends, also falls under the sixth commandment. We are not given the privilege or the right to take our own lives. Now, this brings up medical concerns and medical questions, and I would love to have a class on this. I have a friend, Dr. John Dunlap, uh, recently retired, who taught at my two churches ago where I used to serve in Gurney on this very subject, on end-of-life issues, for it was his specialty. He was a gerontologist. And he taught a wonderful class. And in his class, he talked about the difference between end-of-life decisions and euthanasia. The difference between refusing certain medications and ending life. We could go into that more here if we had more time. But know this, friends. I would strongly encourage you. The scriptures do not encourage us, but rather discourage us in the area of euthanasia as it falls under the sixth commandment. Well, how does Jesus deepen then? Or what does Jesus say about the sixth commandment? Let's turn to Matthew's gospel, chapter 5. If you have your Bibles, I'd encourage you to open there. Matthew, chapter 5, verses 21 through 26. Matthew, chapter 5, verses 21 through 26. Matthew records these words from Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. 
You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, you fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. So, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you are going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge and the judge to the guard and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. Now, I think it is extremely interesting and worthy of pointing out that just after Jesus says in verses 17 through 20 that he is not here to abolish the law but to fulfill the law, he launches into the sixth commandment. And shortly after that, we're into the seventh commandment and the next passage that we'll read later in our sermon here. So he recognizes, just as, of course, Moses, and then obviously God the author, <clears throat> whom Jesus is both man and God, that these, there's a reason for these. These are in- critically important for us to recognize. And often the two greatest dangers, anger and lust. So focusing on anger. We've already seen this in Genesis 4 and in the passage <clears throat> in uh, Deuteronomy that God cares about the heart. He cares about our intention. He doesn't just care about our external actions, but about our internal motivations. And so Jesus just highlights this, right? Because he knows, and we know, friends, that anger, if left unchecked, can lead to murder. Shakespeare illustrates this several times over. In his genre of plays, the tragedies, so Macbeth or Hamlet, we see God's grace removed from the circumstances. God's grace is removed from the story and anger is often left, is therefore left unchecked by God's grace and it runs its full course and everyone dies. Sorry if I ruined Macbeth or Hamlet for you. But that's the idea of a tragedy. That's the point. If God's grace is removed, if our anger is left unchecked, it runs its course. And that's why he developed this style of play, a tragedy, to get the point across. Yes, it's heavy-handed, but it's supposed to be. Because, friends, in our hearts, murder has a way, I'm sorry, anger has a way of festering and festering. Hebrews talks about roots of bitterness, that image of deep roots. I've had them. I understand. They poison everything. And how many movies have we seen over the years that explore this very same theme to where left unchecked, someone's life is taken? When left unchecked, anger develops. So friends, take your anger seriously. Jesus does. This is a good time even right now. If there's something that you're going, oh Lord, I know, I know I've I've been stewing on this. Write that down. Commit that to prayer. Share that with a friend. If you're really troubled after the sermon, please come down. The elders and I will pray for you. We love you. We don't want to see roots of bitterness strangle the fruit in your life and the joy. For as one author said some years ago, it's like drinking poison and hoping the person you hate will die. It's like drinking poison and hoping that the person you hate will die. So again, I want to encourage you, please, today is a great day to deal with this. God's Spirit and His people want to help you. Don't waste this chance. Positively speaking, friends, honor life. Honor life. There's a sanctity of life that God has bestowed on all His image bearers. And we, church, are called to honor life. Commandment number seven you shall not commit adultery. Chapter 20, verse 14. Or the positive side of that, honor marriage. Well, what is adultery? 
Nothing simple, or nothing complex here, right? It is the betrayal of one spouse by having a relationship with someone who is not their spouse. I don't like to use the word affair because I feel like it, it, it lessens the blow. It makes it sound like it was just a little jaunt or a trip. No, adultery is the breaking of the marriage covenant and is a legitimate reason for divorce. <clears throat> well, let's back up then real quick. What is marriage? <clears throat> and if you're a note taker, I think this is memorable and may help you. Marriage is one flesh, two complements, but three is the key. Marriage is one flesh, two complements, but three is the key. Well, let's turn back to Genesis. Speaking of roots, <clears throat> Genesis chapter 2, verses 19, excuse me, verses 18 and following. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make for him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave, gave names to all its livestock and to the birds of the heavens, every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man and while he slept, took out one of his ribs, closed it up, closed up its place with flesh, and the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his mother, of his father and his mother, and hold fast or cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and not ashamed. They were both naked and not ashamed. So what is marriage? Marriage is one flesh. It is the union of one man and one woman coming together and sharing the most intimate gift of marriage. That is sex. <clears throat> they are one flesh together. Marriage is also two complements, right? At the very basic level, it's a man and a woman, complementary. Gender-wise, complementary, gender-wise. Also complementary in roles. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 and following. <clears throat> the elders and I just read this yesterday. We took the morning to pray and to read, and we read through the entire book of Ephesians. And our prayer was, Lord, show us what you have done for the church, what you wish to do through your church, and how you're calling us as elders uniquely to fulfill that. So this passage is just fresh on my mind. Notice the compl complementary nature. And by the way, complementary does not mean varsity, junior varsity. Okay? Complementary is equal value, different roles. Equal value, different roles. Both man and woman are made in God's image. <clears throat> Here we go, verse 22. Wives, Submit to your own husbands as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also the wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Again, this could be a whole sermon, but notice, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. Key qualifier, ladies. Key qualifier. The husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church his body, and as himself its Savior. One of the elders yesterday said, you know, I think at times we men have abused this passage in a desire to have our wives, you know, submit to us. We only point out this part, that it's, hey, it's your job to submit. And we forget about what we're called to. And I notice, by the way, it's longer. Verse 25, husbands, Love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Right there, man. Let's read that again. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. That means, at the very basic level, men, we are willing to die for our wives. We are willing to shed our life for our wives. And I think 
I, and I hope all of us men would gladly take a bullet for our wives, would gladly push her out of the way of a moving car. We men are called to have that level of sacrifice for our wives as Christ gave himself up for her, that is the church, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. And in the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourished and cherished it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Last part here, therefore a man shall leave his mother, father and mother, and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. One flesh, two compliments. The wife submits to her husband as unto Christ, and the man leads his wife even unto death. And notice, men, God's calling there that Paul reminds us of, that we are to lead our wives with the desire to cleanse her, to help her in her holiness, in her walk with the Lord. There's no language here of abuse or dictatorship. There's no license for that. And if that is part of your history, today is a great day to repent. So, honor your marriage, or we shall not commit adultery. What is adultery? It is the breaking of the marriage covenant. It is the breaking of the one flesh when one partner seeks out one fleshness with somebody else. Two compliments, but three's the key. Assumed in Ephesians, but more clearly stated in Genesis, which is why Paul quotes it, I think, or part of why, is that in the marriage covenant, it's a three-way deal. Husband, wife, and the Lord. Husband, wife, and the Lord. Otherwise, we could just go to the judge and have the civic ceremony. That's fine. <clears throat> but when we come, and if I marry you, or some, whoever's married you, that pastor, that's hopefully what they reminded you of, that you're making a covenant not only with each other, but with the Lord. It's a three-way deal, and that's awesome. That's empowering. So not only husbands do you want to see your marriage flourish, and wives, not only do you want to see your marriage flourish, but the Lord wants to see your marriage flourish. He wants to help you uh, proof it from adultery, to, to keep that temptation away. So if nothing else, friends, a positive application of this is pray. Pray together when it's going well and when it's not going well. Pray together when it's going well and when it's not going well because we don't want to be threes a crowd. That's when another person gets in there and threes don't work. It's two. One flesh, two compliments, and three is the key. Well, let's talk about some of the dangers, some of the quick dangers here. As Matthew points out from his record of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, there's perhaps no greater danger right now than lust or sexual immorality, and particularly porn. The stats are unbelievable. A couple weeks ago, I noted that a local stat firm or whatever had pointed out that we are spending as a culture, on average, daily, 15 hours on media devices. Not only traditional devices like TVs, but phones, iPads, computers, etc. 15 hours a day. And I think I maybe mentioned, my wife said, no way. <laughs> but, you know, she spends about two minutes on her devices. You know, she's not a tech person in that sense. And I don't want to know what the stats are on porn, but they're, having read them previously, they're horrible. It is so easy now for us to look at lurid images of other people's naked bodies. So just right now, commit, Lord, if I'm struggling with this, I want help to stop. If I'm struggling with this, I want help to stop. Parents, your kids must get your help in protecting them from this. And you have the means. I'll recommend one, Covenant Eyes. Covenant Eyes is not only a filter, but the way it's installed, it reports everything the user views. Everything. 
and then sends a report to the accountability partner. We use it in our family. Our college kids have it installed on their computers, their phones, etc. I could not more highly recommend that. There are other good services, so I'm not trying to plug it. I'm not getting paid for this. But find something that works and help your children avoid seeing those images ever, hopefully, but at least not under your roof. Young men, young women, porn changes your brain. It not only wires you to look at men or women as meat, but it actually changes some of your chemistry. It can be changed back. But the dopamine and all that stuff that I don't fully understand because I'm not a doctor, it's, it's serious stuff. Cut it out. It's not something to play around with in marriage, and it's not something to play around with before you're married. Two, money. Money is always a danger, isn't it, in marriage? It weakens us if we're struggling. Three, power. Power struggles in marriage, just like power in a job, can sometimes corrupt our heart. It can leave us weak. It can be a danger point for adultery to come out of that. Selfishness is certainly a danger for us in marriage and could lead us to be tempted to commit adultery. And I come back to one of the things that I'm prone to, and that is Romantic films. I'm a romantic at heart, I'll be honest. I'm a sucker for a good romantic flick. <clears throat> Some of the really chick flicks bug me, but I like a good romance movie. And I'll be honest, some of those messages in their friends are not Christian, right? It focuses on the pursuit of marriage, not the actual marriage often, right? It's all about getting there, and then once you're there, who knows? Two, it's often focused on how it completes you. In other words, there's this subtle lie that says you must be married to be completed, which then therefore sets an expectation that your spouse should meet all your needs, when in fact the Lord is the only one who can meet all your needs. So sometimes without knowing it in our reading and in our movie perusing, we're un- unknowingly taking in this kind of, this idea that my spouse must complete me. Or even worse, if you're single, you're somehow less of a Christian because you don't have another significant other. That's baloney. That's total baloney. So, selfishness, this idea that my spouse needs to meet all my needs, it stops us from serving one another. Or it creates this kind of, I'll go 50, you go 50. When I think the scriptures teach, you go 100. Even if your spouse is having a tough time. And I could preach on that for a whole week. So (laughs) marriage uh, is, as some authors have recently said lately, It's more about our holiness and less about our personal and immediate happiness. So marriage, friends, was created and is intended to help us with our holiness more than it is to to give us immediate satisfaction and happiness. Now, that is not to say that marriage isn't awesome. It is. I love my wife. My wife and kids have been gone for nine days. Uh, Anna's here with me, but the rest of them's gone. I have told her repeatedly, I miss you, I am lonely. And another brother and I were just talking about when our when our wives are out of the house, I don't sleep well. It's like, you know, a part of me is gone, so to speak. So marriage is a blessing, an immense blessing. But it doesn't diminish your singlehood. In fact, um, I was just talking with an, a college-age student about this just recently. As that person is getting ready for marriage, I said, you know, you're going to look back and realize just how much freedom you have right now in college at being single. Because when you get married and then you start having kids and you've got a real job, well, really, it just points, you realize just how selfish you were. <laughs> you realize just how much free time you had. So, friends, if you are single, relish it. Serve the Lord with, what, with all you got. You're not less, okay? Last but not least here, so we've talked about lust, money, power, selfishness, covet- covetousness. Always a hard word for me to speak, spit out. Covet- covetousness. The idea that the grass is always greener somewhere else. Someone's spouse looks better. Someone's spouse is more successful. Someone's spouse has more stuff. Someone's spouse does all this stuff that I see on social media, etc. Don't let your hearts go there. Don't let your hearts go there. Our whole culture is geared toward creating us to be covetous. It's the the idea of advertising, right? But don't go there. Don't, Don't start shopping around in your mind for other spouses. It's going to lead to a really bad outcome.
Don't destroy your marriage, friends. For those of us who have suffered through the destruction of a marriage, who have, who have experienced the betrayal, oh, the terrible betrayal of adultery, my heart goes out to you. Whether you were the one who committed the adultery or got the horrible news one day. This is a church of broken people. We love you. You're not less. Jesus is just more. So you're in a good place to grow. The sixth commandment, by way of summary, you shall not murder, or positively speaking, we are called to honor life. The seventh commandment, you shall not commit adultery, or positively speaking, honor marriage. May we be known as a people who honor and protect life and honor and protect our marriages. Would you pray with me? Well, Father, there's so much that more that could be said. I pray for those right now who are hurting because of the suffering through death or murder, suicide, abortion, and those that are struggling right now because of broken marriages, adultery, the grip of pornography, covetousness, selfishness, those that are right now in the pain, thinking, I wish I wasn't in this marriage. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would help these dear people to seek the help they need, to get counsel, to get help. Help us as elders to be men who shepherd and care well, especially for our herding sheep. Help us to always care about the one sheep that's left out. Jesus, we look to you ultimately. You're our hope in this life. As we were singing earlier, all we have is Christ. All we have is Christ. So we come to you, Jesus, like the woman at the well, and we want living water. We may not have known it until now, but we want that living water. We want to be washed clean from the sins of our past. We want to feel hope and love and joy again. And we want to have a relationship with you. I pray for those who are praying that with me right now, that Jesus, you would meet them right where they're at. That you, that you would use the members of this body to encourage them, to walk alongside them. And may we who are hurting eventually be healed and help others with their hurting. Thank you for all these things, Jesus. 